The plain truth. President-elect Donald Trump meets with aircraft manufacturers he says are charging the government way too much. This is Special Report. Welcome to Washington. I'm Shannon Bream in for Brett Baer. Leave it to a man with his own 757 airplane to try to cut a deal on a new version of Air Force One. President-elect Donald Trump met today with the makers of the presidential plane and the military's newest war plane to see if he could cut costs that he said are out of control. Correspondent Peter Ducey has the latest tonight from the Trump compound in Florida. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Shannon. The current president once famously talked about getting things done with a pen and a phone. And now we're seeing the next president get things done with a Twitter account because he sat down tonight with the CEOs of two companies that he recently called out on social media, Boeing and Lockheed Martin. And he appears to have even gotten a concession already from Boeing, which he had targeted because Mr. Trump accused them of going way over budget on the next Air Force One. Trump said he was concerned the price tag for two planes had ballooned to more than four billion dollars but at mar-a-lago he was assured it won't cost that much we're going to get it done for less than that and and we're committed to working together to make sure that happens and uh i was able to give the president-elect my uh, personal commitment on behalf of the boeing company Lockheed Martin, meanwhile, manufactures the famously expensive F-35 military aircraft, which Mr. Trump reamed while talking about how he plans to cut costs at the Pentagon. And he said he's still working on lowering that price tag. It's a little bit of a dance, but we're going to get the cost down and we're going to get it done beautifully. And these are great people. And these are amazing people. And your conversation with Boeing. I'm very impressed with them. And good negotiators, too. So whatever ends up happening there, the one certainty during the transition appears to be that tweets are bringing people to the table. We've seen Mr. Trump do it with an air conditioning company, and now we've seen him do it with two airplane companies. Shannon. Well, Peter, I know the president-elect also talked about the terror attack in Germany today as well. Right. The theme of the day here at Mar-a-Lago was national security, not just reducing the costs of defense, but also reducing threats from terrorists. The president-elect met with Pentagon brass in Palm Beach today to receive a presidential daily briefing and spoke for the first time about the deadly terrorist truck attack in Berlin. It's not an attack on humanity. That's what it is. It's an attack on humanity. And it's got to be stopped. Mr. Trump also offered this when asked if he now plans to revisit a campaign pledge to ban Muslims entering the U.S. You know my plans all along. I've been proven to be right. 100% the president-elect also has a message for Democrats still upset he didn't win the popular vote. He says he could have if that was the way to get elected. In a series of tweets, at Real Donald Trump posted, quote, campaigning to win the Electoral College is much more difficult and sophisticated than the popular vote. Hillary focused on the wrong states. I would have done even better in the election if that is possible if the winner was based on popular vote but would campaign differently. I have not heard any of the pundits or commentators discussing the fact that I spent far less money on the win than Hillary on the loss. Politico is reporting that officials are now exploring different kinds of discretionary trusts to help the businessman turned president-elect avoid conflicts of interest from the Oval Office, something former House Speaker Newt Gingrich says Trump should do, even though, according to Gingrich, Trump no longer likes to use the term drain the swamp. He has to understand and his family has to understand that there is a public interest which transcends them. At the same time, we have to understand that this is a new situation we've never seen before, and the rules that were written for people who were dramatically less successful literally do not work. With 30 days till the inauguration, a new leading contender to become Veterans Affairs Secretary has emerged. It's Cleveland Clinic CEO Dr. Toby Cosgrove, who sources say impressed Mr. Trump during his Tuesday visit to Mar-a-Lago. And insiders say there's a reason it's taking so long to fill this particular cabinet slot. The issue is, is there somebody, number one, who could be a good manager of the good hospitals that exist, because there are good VA hospitals, and is there someone who has the courage to fight what's going to be a tough battle? which is that you would think it'd be easy to give a veteran a card and then he can go to Mount Sinai Hospital but or he go to New York Hospital or some other hospital. Uh, the union pressure against that is enormous. 
This afternoon, Mr. Trump named billionaire investor Carl Icahn a special advisor to the president on regulatory reform. Icahn said in a statement tonight he thinks regulations and all the paperwork that comes with them really slow growth, so he wants to cut a lot of it out. He thinks it'll create a lot of jobs. Shannon? All right, a busy day at Mar-a-Lago. Peter, thank you very much. Tonight, the hunt for the driver of a truck that rammed into a Christmas market crowd in Berlin is expanding. We learned today the main suspect is a Tunisian man with ties to Islamic extremists who was already on the radar of law enforcement. We have Fox team coverage. Rich Edson has a look at whether the terror threat is growing, but we begin with senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott reporting again tonight from Berlin. Hello, Greg. Hi, Shannon. He is armed and dangerous, authorities say. He is on the loose, and they are under a lot of pressure to find the man responsible for this attack. You are looking at the face of the man German police believe could be responsible for the horrible carnage at a Berlin Christmas market Monday, which left 12 dead and nearly 50 hurt. There is a new suspect. A manhunt is ongoing. Like everyone, I would like to point out that we are talking about a suspect, not necessarily a perpetrator. The investigation continues to be conducted in all directions. His name is Anas Amri, a 24-year-old Tunisian man who came to Germany in last year's massive refugee wave. He was turned down for asylum this year, but remained due to a paperwork snafu. He was also arrested for forged documents and let go. The German wanted poster lists his aliases. He was known to have contacts with Germany's chief ISIS recruiter, who was arrested last month. ISIS heaped praise on the attacker yesterday. And he was on a terror watch list under covert surveillance for several months. Authorities suspected he was planning something. Uh, this person, person has been noticed by various security uh, authorities in Germany in the, in the context of contacts to a radical Islamic, Islamic circle. But incredibly, the suspect was able to go underground in the weeks before the attack. And the only way police suspected him was because he left his wallet with ID papers in the truck. And his personal belongings were only found a day after the attack. As authorities step up their nationwide, Europe-wide search for the man, they're taking a lot of heat themselves after they'd already arrested and released another suspect. Also for the lack of security at public gatherings. And German Chancellor Angela Merkel and her open-door refugee policy is criticized as well. More officials saying that's led to insecurity. As some Germans start to rethink their welcome culture. There are several uh, bad minds uh, that have come with them, with the refugees, and uh, we regret that uh, very much. There is word tonight of raids here in Berlin in connection with the search for the suspect. No arrests are reported. This as German officials offer a reward of approximately $100,000 equivalent for information tied to him. A small price for a big crime. Shannon. All right, Greg Palcott live in Berlin for us. Thank you. Former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani says the world is a more dangerous place now than when President Obama took office. True, false, or a matter of opinion? Correspondent Rich Edson takes a look at the year in terrorism from the State Department tonight. ISIS says this is its work. If it is responsible, Berlin joins Istanbul and Nice in 11 ISIS-related major attacks in Europe this year. Last year, the group claimed 16 major attacks across the continent. In the United States, over the past 12 months, attacks in San Bernardino, California and Orlando, Florida mark the two deadliest here since September 11, 2001. There are perennial hubs for the growth of terrorism. Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, Afghanistan are really the major hubs. So we are seeing a, a diffusing, diffusing pattern of uh, where groups go to, uh, to build their terrorist networks uh, and to further launch terrorist attacks on the West. Worldwide, terrorist attacks have risen steadily since 2001, according to the University of Maryland's Global Terrorism Database. In 2012, the frequency of attacks increased substantially through 2015 as the Islamic State expanded through Iraq and Syria. Republicans charged the Obama administration's military withdrawal from the Middle East and restraint in deploying against the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq have allowed terrorist organizations to flourish. The administration denies that, though acknowledges ISIS remains a danger. We knew even before we started to see that pressure having an effect on them as an organization 
that they were also going to try to branch out. The administration also claims it has degraded ISIS capabilities by attacking and killing its leadership. And while the West focuses on terrorism in the United States and Europe, most attacks hit countries in Africa and the Middle East. The State Department says last year terrorism in 10 countries accounted for nearly three quarters of all attacks. None of those 10 are in Europe or North America. Still, analysts say the West is vulnerable. I am pessimistic about whether or not this organization, ISIS, and other global terrorists are going to be able to continue to conduct attacks in the West. That trend line is going to continue. And as the United States continues fighting the Islamic State in Syria, Russia is driving ceasefire negotiations there, as Vladimir Putin's primary objective is the preservation of the Assad regime and seemingly only fights the Islamic State to that end. Shannon? Rich Edson, live from the State Department. Thank you. The Kremlin says it's too early to know who was behind the assassination of Russia's ambassador to Turkey. Today, there was a claim of responsibility, and Russia's president is asking his people to be vigilant. Senior foreign affairs correspondent Amy Kellogg has the latest. The body of slain Russian ambassador to Turkey, Andrei Gennadievich Karloff, was given full honors in Turkey before being flown home to Moscow yesterday. Russian investigators stayed behind in Ankara to work with Turkish counterparts. Both have said this does not appear to be the work of one man. 22-year-old riot police officer Mevlut Mert Altintas shot dead by Turkish forces on the spot. Today, a statement of a conglomeration of Syrian rebel factions called the Army of Conquest circulated, claiming responsibility for the attack. Russia has propped up Syrian President Bashar al-Assad in his fight against the rebels, most recently in Aleppo. Large protests had broken out outside Russian missions in Turkey, which had always been on the side of the rebels, in the days leading up to the ambassador's assassination. President Vladimir Putin, realizing the level of threat worldwide, addressed his officers at an event last night. I ask security services to take additional measures to ensure security inside Russia and outside it. I ask you to step up work with secret services of other states through partner channels. Russia has vowed not to let the assassination harm ties with Turkey, but Putin did say that the murder was a blow to Ankara's prestige. Turkey, having suffered more than two dozen terror attacks and a failed military coup this year, is struggling with security. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan blamed this man, reclusive Imam Fethullah Gulen, for the coup, and some in his government say the ambassador's killer was a Gulen supporter, that the gunman's Islamist rants were a disguise. Gulen lives in exile in Pennsylvania. There were even some innuendos of blame in Turkey towards the United States for its harboring of Gulen, but the State Department has dismissed them, saying we must wait and see what the joint investigative team comes up with. Shannon. Amy, thank you. President Obama has a Christmas present for his not-so-good buddy Vladimir Putin, more sanctions over Russia's annexation of Crimea. Correspondent Kevin Cork is traveling with the president in Hawaii and reports on the latest bump in the road of a very rocky relationship. So much for the Russia reset. The relationship between us and Russia has deteriorated, uh, sadly significantly over the last several years. So a deterioration that's seen the Obama administration increase pressure on the Kremlin by extending economic sanctions on an additional 17 Russian entities just this week, each related to ongoing projects in Crimea, which Moscow annexed back in 2014. The Russians say the latest moves by the U.S. Treasury are part of a pattern of aggressive behavior by Washington. Almost every level of dialogue with the United States is frozen. We don't communicate with one another, or we do so minimally. I don't know what to make of his comments. I think you should ask Mr. Peskov what he means by his comments. What I can tell you is from our perspective, there's no break in the dialogue. U.S. officials suggest it's Moscow's meddling that's the real reason behind the diplomatic deep freeze. From its incursion into Ukraine, the continued bombing of Syria, even its alleged hacking activities during the run-up to the 2016 election. If Russia and the United States got along well and went after ISIS, that would be good. President-elect Trump has made no secret of his desire to bridge the gap in relations with Moscow, leading some to wonder if the timing of the Obama administration's new sanctions was meant to blunt any future reconciliation. This decision by the Treasury Department...
do with the time on the clock. It had everything to do with Russia's activities uh, and support for the separatists in Ukraine and for their occupation of uh, Crimea. Experts believe those waiting for a major shift in U.S.-Russia policy under a Trump administration will do so in vain. Uh, the Russians simply cannot be relied upon as a partner or an ally for the United States. And as long as Mr. Putin is in power in Moscow, I really don't see how U.S.-Russian relations are going to be fundamentally uh, transformed. Shannon, another possible motivation for the U.S., solidarity with EU partners in the European Union. Keep in mind, very recently, they just renewed a six-month sanctions package on the Russians, a package that will likely continue for many months to go. Back to you. Kevin Cork traveling with the president. Thank you, Kevin. Syrian rebels say they have reached an agreement with the government to complete their withdrawal from Aleppo. The opposition agreed to surrender its last foothold in the city several days ago. Some 3,000 rebel fighters and civilians stood outside in harsh, wintry conditions overnight, waiting to board buses. The Taliban in Afghanistan says it is ready for peace talks with the U.S. under certain conditions. The Afghan government has already rejected the Taliban's demands. The U.S. is preparing to pull a significant number of troops out of the country before the president leaves office. But Pentagon producer Lucas Tomlinson tells us tonight there are still a handful of Americans out of the president's reach. Twelve Americans have been killed in Afghanistan since early October. Five are currently being held hostage there. This as the U.S. military pulls out more than a thousand troops by January, part of President Obama's July order. The latest partial withdrawal of American forces comes as violence in the country continues. Last month, five Americans were killed in a deadly suicide attack at the largest American base in Afghanistan. Roughly a dozen were badly wounded, many still recovering at the Walter Reed Medical Center outside Washington, D.C. The Taliban now says it wants to restart peace talks with the United States. The State Department wants the Afghan government to take the lead. What we support is an Afghan-led reconciliation process. Uh, we believe that's the, the right approach. We've always believed that that's the right approach. Complicating matters, the top U.S. commander in Afghanistan says the Taliban is getting help from Iran and Russia. This um, public uh, legitimacy that Russia lends to the Taliban is not based on fact, but it is used as a way to essentially undermine the Afghan government and the NATO effort. General Nicholson says he has forces over the horizon that can launch on a moment's notice should they be needed. Among the five American hostages held by the Haqqani Network, a Taliban faction, are Caitlin Coleman and her two young children, both born in captivity. Her husband is Canadian. The family was kidnapped while hiking in Afghanistan four years ago. Coleman was pregnant at the time. The U.S. government considers the Haqqani Network the most lethal and sophisticated group in Afghanistan and Pakistan, responsible for killing hundreds of U.S. forces. It's the same group that kidnapped Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, later exchanged for five Taliban prisoners from Gitmo. The Haqqanis are also holding an American professor and a man from Massachusetts. A short time ago, an official told Fox News that Caitlin Coleman's husband had expressed interest in converting to Islam and meeting the Taliban shortly before being captured. Shannon? Lucas, thank you. The Obama administration says 6.4 million people have signed up for health care during uh, health care insurance during the current enrollment period. That is ahead of last year's pace, but it might not be enough to meet the administration's goal of 13.8 million signups. The system has been hampered by a major increase in premiums and a decrease in the numbers of insurers participating. Stocks were off today. The Dow lost 33. The S&P 500 was down six. Nasdaq dropped 12 and a half. Up next, an horrific scene after fireworks explode at a Mexican market, leaving dozens dead. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 5 in New York, where police say the man caught on a surveillance camera stealing $1.6 million worth of gold flakes off an armored truck is a pro. They say the man has been deported several times to his native Ecuador, and they believe he might be in Los Angeles right now. Fox 10 in Phoenix, where a FedEx driver tried unsuccessfully to keep two men from stealing his truck while he was out making deliveries. The driver hung on to the side of the vehicle for a time as the suspects drove away. 
The truck's been found. The suspects are still at large, and now FedEx is working to determine how many packages are missing. And this is a live look at Chicago from Fox 32. The big story there tonight, Illinois has lost more residents than any other state in a single year. Figures show a decline of almost 38,000 people from July of 2015 to this July. The fastest growing state is Utah. That is tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. At least 32 people are dead in a massive explosion at a Mexican fireworks market, and that total is likely to rise. The powerful chain reaction blast ripped through the market stalls, sending up a towering plume of smoke lit up by staccato of bangs and flashes of light. A Mexican prosecutor says some of the dead were so badly burned that neither their age nor gender could be determined. There are also still several people missing. Senior correspondent Adam Housley reports on a tragic accident that is all too common in Mexico. The explosions seemed endless as hundreds try to escape the San Pablito public marketplace in Toltepec, about 20 miles north of Mexico City. The self-proclaimed fireworks capital of the country erupted Tuesday as shoppers stocked up for the holiday season. It's a Mexican tradition to set off fireworks after Christmas mass. It was very loud. There were several explosions, and we saw the smoke. We did think it was the gas station, but then we saw it was the fireworks. A series of blasts came one after the other, and people started to fall down a lot. They started running, and then many people were falling, and pieces of concrete and bricks started falling all over the street. Witnesses captured the blast, which kept emergency crews away from the scene. The area looked more like a war zone, as more than 70 were injured, many severely burned, some already transported to U.S. burn units. This is a tragic moment for everyone because many of us have lost family members here. We can't find them. Horrible. By some accounts, there were more than 300 tons of fireworks being sold at the marketplace. Mexico has a history with fireworks factory explosions and accidents. There have been seven over the last couple of decades in the country, and this is the third time at this location since 2005. I don't have words now. I can't find my father. I can't can't find my father, and my mother is very badly burned. Local reports say the site was inspected last month, but emergency personnel suggest a lack of safety measures is likely the cause. The local governor has vowed to find who or what is responsible, while Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto, in a tweet, expressed condolences to the families of those lost and also a speedy recovery for those injured. Shannon. Adam Hasley, thank you. State media in China say that the dense smog smothering much of the country the past five days should be clearing soon. Schools have been closed, flights canceled, and factories completely shut down. China has long had some of the worst air quality in the world, blamed on its reliance on coal and a surplus of older, less efficient cars. The bishop of an African-American church in Mississippi that was burned and spray-painted with, quote, vote Trump, says the man arrested in the case is a member of the church. Police in Greenville have arrested 45-year-old man uh, from Leland, Mississippi. He is black. He's been charged with first-degree arson of a place of worship. North Carolina lawmakers are deciding what to do about a controversial law regarding LGBT issues that critics claim has cost the state in jobs, economics, and public relations. But it is a complicated formula. Senior National Correspondent John Roberts is live tonight with details. Uh, good evening, John. All right, earlier in the week, the repeal seemed to be a done deal, but there are twists and turns, it seems, by the minute. No, Shannon, complex is an understatement in terms of what's going on in North Carolina right now. The North Carolina Senate has just taken a recess after taking up a measure that would repeal the so-called bathroom bill, HB2, which stipulates that transgender individuals have to use the public restroom of the gender identified in their birth certificate. That bill was passed back in March in response to an ordinance enacted by the city of Charlotte back in February, which allowed transgender individuals to use the bathroom corresponding to the gender that they identify with. That bathroom bill ignited a firestorm of criticism against the state of North Carolina that cost hundreds of millions of dollars in lost business. The NCAA, NBA, and artists like Bruce Springsteen all canceled events in North Carolina. Major companies withdrew plans to expand business there, and the Department of Justice sued the state. Now, because of the damage to North Carolina's economy and reputation, twice this year, the state's Republican governor, Pat McCrory, offered to convene a special session of the legislature to repeal the 
bill if Charlotte would repeal its ordinance. But Charlotte Mayor Jennifer Roberts twice refused. Fast forward to November the 8th. McCrory lost to Democrat Roy Cooper in the gubernatorial election. Over the weekend, Cooper lobbied the Charlotte City Council to move on the deal that McCrory had offered earlier. The council accepted, and as you mentioned earlier this week, voted to repeal the ordinance. McCrory, who lost the election at least partially because of the bathroom bill, accused Cooper and the council of playing politics. Listen. You know, the sudden reversal with little notice after the gubernatorial election has ended sadly proves this entire issue originated by the political left was all about politics at the expense of Charlotte and the entire state of North Carolina. Shannon, we've been watching this all day today. It has been delay upon delay upon delay and no way to know at this point which way it's going to go. Well, John, what has this holdup been about? I mean, it it seems like we get a bit of news. There's a new coalition. There's a new measure. Uh, Any progress you foresee moving forward now? As you mentioned at the top of the, Shannon, it looked like it was a done deal, but there are a lot of Republicans, mostly from rural districts, who don't want to repeal the bathroom bill. They say that they might lose election in 2018 if it's repealed. Then there are other Republicans who are concerned that if the bathroom bill is repealed, some other municipality, maybe even Charlotte, again, will move to enact a similar ordinance to the one that was enacted in February. So the Senate bill includes a cooling off period, which would prohibit municipalities from doing anything uh, with within either a six-month period or until 30 days after the legislature adjourns for its long 2017 session. Democrats are vehemently opposed to this, thinking that it's going to lead to a permanent ban on such ordinances. And there are some Republicans who fought close races in urban areas who just might join them. The House, meantime, sitting on the sidelines, watching all of this, figuring out how to proceed. Could go late in the night, or it may go into tomorrow, Shannon, or it may go into the new year. We'll soon find out. Shannon? All right. Keep us up. Updated John Roberts. Thank you. Thanks. Our series on the first 100 days of the Trump administration continues tonight with law and order. It was a big rallying point for the Maverick Republican candidate. Now we get to see if he meant what he said. Senior correspondent Rick Leventhal takes a look from New York. The thin blue line, the men and women in uniform, were a focal point of President-elect Donald Trump's campaign. To all law enforcement in America, we are with you, we support you, and we will always stand with you. We love you. Now, as Mr. Trump prepares to move into the White House, officers across the country say law enforcement should remain a top priority. What I care about, and I think that what the the administration, what the Department of Justice, uh, Homeland Security, what everybody cares about is, do people feel safe? Are people safe in their neighborhoods where they live? And that's what we're trying to accomplish. A key component of Trump's 100-day action plan to make America great again is centered on policing. Restoring Community Safety Act reduces surging crime, drugs, and violence by creating a task force on violent crime and increasing funding for programs that train and assist your local police who are doing such a great job, believe me. His close advisors say President Trump is willing to use the power of the office to get things done. It's incredibly important for people to feel like they have the resources in the neighborhoods. And for those who say this is heavy-handed federal government, they have to realize when you're the president and you can give voice and visibility to people's concerns about law enforcement locally and crime and safety in their communities, that is leadership. The dangers police face on the job has been one of Mr. Trump's biggest talking points. An attack on our police is an attack on all of us. Law enforcement is the line separating Civilization from total chaos. You have to remember that. At least 62 police officers have been killed by firearms in the line of duty already this year. A sharp increase over the 41 gunned down in 2015. This rarely leads to protest marches. But demonstrations against police involved in shootings of civilians have become commonplace in America's biggest cities, even when investigations show many of the suspects were armed or resisted arrest. 
there's this expectation of the public that if the police are trained well enough, every encounter we have with the police will end just fine. And that if it doesn't end fine, it's because the police officer did something wrong. Well, that, that's just an unrealistic standard to, to put on uh, any cop. Tom Manger is chief of police in Montgomery County, Maryland. He's also president of the Major Cities Chiefs Association and says the challenges cops face in today's environment has made it tougher to find qualified applicants willing to risk their lives in the face of hostility and intense scrutiny. The fact is that oftentimes when we're dealing with someone out on the street, it's up to them how, how the encounter goes. Um, we can do everything, everything as best we can to de-escalate it, but sometimes um, the, the person we're dealing with just doesn't allow that to happen. Mr. Trump's plan promises to pump more money into local police departments for training and equipment. But civil rights advocates worry the president-elect's support for stop-and-frisk policies could lead to more hostility between officers and the communities they patrol. Because, as the ACLU's Jeffrey Robinson argues, studies have shown the vast majority of folks targeted under the policy have done nothing wrong. You cannot stop crime by stopping and harassing innocent people. And there is no legitimate business in America that would come into your community or mine and say, we have a product with an 80% failure rate and we want you to buy it. Ultimately, criminology professor Jack McDevitt says communities need to work with police and police need to conduct themselves within the framework of the law. They're putting their lives on the line for us every day and it's hugely important that we do support them. But we also have to understand they're people too and they make mistakes like all of us do. And so a blanket support isn't helpful. We give them one of the most important responsibilities in our society. We tell them that they can use force and they can, in very rare circumstances, take a life. And to give them that responsibility comes with accountability. And we have to be able to hold police officers accountable when they cross the line. The nation's largest police department, the NYPD, has put additional focus on sensitivity training and community policing, hoping to improve the relationships between cops and the people in the neighborhoods they patrol. And other agencies across the country are following this lead. It's still not clear how a Trump administration might influence this trend. In New York, Rick Leventhal, Fox News. Our 15-part series looking ahead to the first 100 days of the Trump presidency continues tomorrow with a focus on Trump's plans for bringing jobs back to America and discouraging companies from setting up shop overseas. You can watch all of the parts of the series on our show homepage, foxnews.com slash special report. The manhunt goes on in Europe for the terrorist who rammed a truck into a crowd of Christmas shoppers. Tis the season for terror. We'll talk about it with the panel when we come back. All right, that was President-elect Donald Trump today talking about the uh, attack in Berlin. Let's bring in our panel to talk about that and more. Steve Hayes, editor-in-chief of the Weekly Standard. Julie Pace, White House correspondent for the Associated Press. Political reporter Jonathan Swan. And Charles Hurt, political columnist for the Washington Times. Good to see you all. Good to see you. Um, Steve, I'll start with you. Uh, he has not minced words in any of his statements regarding this issue throughout the campaign and now in the wake of these attacks. But what does it mean going forward? Do, what do you think it will mean as far as translating into policy? Uh, you know, we're going to wipe these people off the map. How does that work? That's a really big question. I think it's one of the real open questions of the Trump administration. He's made no secret of the fact that he uh, rejects President Obama's sort of willingness or eagerness to wait a few days, even after we have information in some cases, to declare a terrorist attack a terrorist attack, to call radical Islamic terrorists radical Islamic terrorists. But what's unclear in talking to a lot of the people who are going to be advising Donald Trump about this is exactly how things are going to change on a day to day basis. I don't think anybody should doubt the, the, you know, President Trump's resolve to solve the problem, to address the problem. We just don't know much about the specifics at this point. And today down at Mar-a-Lago, he had some very important meetings on a number of issues, but there was a picture that they issued um, with a number of military leaders, top uh, officials there who had met with him. Uh, we understand that he is getting plenty of briefings, although there's been a lot of controversy over that, Julie. Um, but these real world events kind of speed up the need for some focus. They absolutely do. I mean, in about four weeks, these are gonna be issues that he's not just expected to talk about, but he's expected to make 
policy decisions around. And he talked in the campaign about the rhetoric that he believes that the American president should use. Certainly that is an easy piece for him to address, but that doesn't actually solve the problem. And I think that he is going to have to really start to get more detailed. World leaders are going to be calling him when events happen in their country, wondering what the American response is going to be. And we assume he's discussing that in his private meetings, but none of those details are yet being revealed. Maybe we'll find out on Twitter. Maybe, Maybe that's how the world will find out. Uh, listen, it gives him an immediacy and breaks through um, layers and filters that he's not been a fan of, and people have definitely um, attached to that, and it's worked in uh, appealing to a lot of folks. Jonathan, um, Julie mentioned world leaders. Right now, of course, German Chancellor Angela Merkel um, really in a tough place. Um, Trump has been critical of her. How do you perceive their relationship proceeding? This is one of the most interesting storylines that people should watch. Trump himself doesn't believe in the European Union as a project. Steve Bannon doesn't believe in the European Union as a project. Angela Merkel is a stunningly weak leader at the moment. She opened the borders, uh, refugees and migrants, and she's also working with the European Union in Brussels that's issuing, literally dictating quotas of migrants for countries. And you're seeing Hungary, Viktor Orban, you're seeing Slovakia push back on this. We're watching as the Trump the Trumpism, you know, arrives in Washington, you're watching the crumbling of the European project. And these two things happening over the Trump administration is going to be one of the most fascinating stories. Yeah. How do you see this playing out, Charlie, as, as we watch a number of those Euro European countries yeah. now have serious concerns and backlash within their own internal elections? Yeah. Well, I think Jonathan is exactly right. Uh, but one of the things that we, we do know about, uh, about a lot of these attacks is they would have been prevented <coughs> had, uh, had, had had policies been in place, such as what Donald Trump has talked about, about this extreme vetting from places where we know people want, th th there are some really terrible people who want to kill civilized people, who want to kill people uh, who are Christians, who want to kill people who believe in, uh, in, in freedom. Uh, and uh, th I think that that, and this is a big reason why he won the election, that you get in a lot of trouble making that claim. He got into a lot of trouble making that claim and making that, uh, suggesting that policy. And, and of course, all of us would like to pretend like we don't need such uh, uh, measures in place. We would like to not have borders. We'd like to have neighbors that are really nice and not trying to. But that's not the fact. The, the fact is that there are these people who are trying to kill civilized people and 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 putting measures in place to make sure that those people that we that, that come here for humanitarian purposes or whatever are are completely thoroughly vetted is is a very important first step. Did we hear Charlie say we would like not to not have borders? I mean, well, I'm going to start calling he you said, open borders, Charlie. He said if we had no, no, nice, no, if we had nice good neighbors. <laughs> he, there's a big caveat there. He said if we had you, nice, come come good on, brothers and neighbors. Fairly. That's what he said. <laughs> That's, That's what, what this is. Fair and balanced. Well, we let, me, let me actually fairly. build on Charlie's point, if I could, just for a second. There was an interesting report today in a, in a, on a website called Breaking Defense by James Kitfield, who's a, a well-known national security reporter, really one of the best ones. And he it was, it was a profile of, of uh, Mike Flynn, the new national mm -hmm. security advisor, and in this uh, report that, that Kitfield had, he talked about the National Intelligence Council and an NIE, a national intelligence estimate that they were preparing in 2012, in which the U.S. intelligence community was prepared to declare by consensus that Al-Qaeda was no longer a threat to the United States. In 2012? You think about where we are today and how wrong that calculation was. And they couldn't come to a consensus, in part because Mike Flynn, mm -hmm. who's going to be the National Security Advisor, objected and said, no, wait a second, Al-Qaeda has actually doubled its strength. I mean, he made strong arguments internally that kept that from happening. But the fact that you had so many people supporting, I think, the ideological outcome of what President Obama wanted, which was in effect to say the war on terror is over because we say the war on terror is over. Mm -hmm. It's a reminder of just how wrong the Obama policy is and I would say to a certain extent the intelligence assessments that supported that policy. Well were. and people of course will point to his JV statement about ISIS to back up that particular theory. I want to talk a little bit about this suspect because apparently he uh, traveled into Italy in 2012, made it to Germany in July of 2015. He did eventually apply for asylum. Apparently was not uh, granted. He was going 
going to be deported at one point. He was arrested. He was being held. But because of all the phony IDs and the inability to identify exactly who he was, Julie, they let him go. One of the, the most, I think, troubling details that we've seen from German officials is that he had so many different identifications, so many different points of origin that he was claiming when he was dealing with officials there. And that is part of the complexity of this issue. Europe faces an even bigger challenge in the fact that you have so many countries who do essentially have open borders. You can travel so freely between countries. It's a different situation than we have here. But it gets to a similar issue, which is that you're not just talking about simple solutions. You can't just put up a wall at the border. You can't just say that you're going to deport people who are living here illegally because you have people who, in some cases, do have multiple identities, in some cases, have managed to skirt the system. And that's where we need more information from Trump if he is going to be moving forward on these policies. Well, asked today about his immigration policies or plans, he said something about, he said, what, what's happening is disgraceful. Um, he says, you've known my plans all along. I have been and proven to be right 100% correct, Jonathan. Well, Trump loves to say that. He, he, <laughs> he said it about Anthony Weiner. He was, uh, you know, was very eager to dictate a statement about the when the whole thing went down with Humer and Anthony Weiner because he likes being uh, predictive. But just to pick up on one of Julie's points, it's exactly right. And you know, I was talking today to a, a source, a senior source in the Republican foreign policy community on the Hill, and they were pointing out that. Europeans have terrible surveillance because there's this culture of privacy mm -hmm. there. So this is another complexity and it's you know a long running complexity in the relations there. So, you know, what's Trump gonna do about that and how's that debate gonna play out? It's very hard to, to see how this is all gonna wash out. All right, panel, stick around. Up next, we're gonna go domestic. The North Carolina bathroom law. The debate continues. This was not a North Carolina state agenda. No one in North Carolina was talking about bathroom policy until the Charlotte City Council imposed a mandate on private businesses. The state legislature and this governor also believed that guidelines then needed to be put in place because of this new public topic. For government buildings, our schools, and our rest stops, to ensure privacy and expectation privacy for everyone. All right, we are back with our panel to talk about the fight over North Carolina's HB2. Charlie, the fight continues. Our John Roberts has been covering this all day. The Democrats are going to introduce something. The Republicans are... It, it's unresolved there in North Carolina, to say the least. Um, but a lot of people think it cost Governor McCrory his reelection. Oh, I think without any doubt whatsoever, it cost him his reelection. He should have won. Uh, he's uh, he, he has you know he's good on a whole lot of things uh, for, for Republicans down there. But to, to lack that political sense to know not to touch something like this uh, is what cost him that. That even people who support the notion behind uh, HB two. D or disagree with the law HB2 because it's just obnoxious. It's just like it's like why are we? Why is the government legislating something like this? And I and I, again not not to harp on uh, Donald Trump, but I, you go back to Donald Trump. The guy had the political instinct at the time when everybody thought he was going to jump in and, and be on Pat McCrory's side. He said, "Nah, I, I, I got I got nothing to say on it. This is stupid." Yeah, and he was actually mm -hmm. asked, "Would he let Caitlyn Jenner?" use which bathrooms at Trump Tower or at Trump facilities or something like that and he said whichever bathrooms Caitlin wants to use so yeah he didn't get involved with that I want to read a little bit of what the North Carolina uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest had to say he said I support HB2 and do not favor its repeal no economic political or ideological pressure can convince me that what is wrong is right it will always be wrong for men to have access to women's showers and bathrooms he went on to say the left has already publicly stated the removal of HB2 is necessary for the rest of their agenda to move forward with certainty, if HB2 is repealed, we will fight this battle all over again with another city or county. Jonathan. Yes, and there's some speculation in North Carolina Republican circles about what his political ambitions are, so this could be a, a platform for that. But this has really been, from the start, genius politics from the Democrats. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they love this issue. The longer they can keep it uh, alive, the better. And they're exploiting the fact that the Republicans are divided, because as, as we saw from the presentation before, uh, you know, there are Republicans in the legislature who sincerely believe, as a matter of social conservative principles, this is good policy, and they don't want to repeal it. There are others in the business wing who see all these sporting events and various other things leaving the state and they want to repeal it and just get it off their backs. And 
the longer they're divided, the longer it's an issue, the Democrats will keep building them up with it. Well, and Julie, there is speculation that even from the relatively left-leaning mayor in Charlotte, that this was a calculation a long time ago that it would help Roy Cooper in his run for the governorship if they got McCrory and the legislature entangled in this thing. And if that was the plan, then McCrory fell for it. I mean, there's some <laughs> irony in McCrory being the fall guy for this because his reputation before this past year was more of a business-minded, mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce Republican. He was he was popular, and everything that he was hoping to campaign for in his re-election was overshadowed by this. In the mm -hmm. end, he was the governor that signed the law, and it became impossible for him to walk away from that. So politicians play politics. Everyone mm -hmm. in the game should know that. Well, when I worked in Charlotte, I covered both uh, Governor McCrory and Governor-elect Cooper uh, in their state roles there. And so they've all been in the system for a long mm -hmm. time. And you can calculate some of these things when they're coming down the pike. Um, Steve, CNBC actually named North Carolina number five on the list of America's top states for business. The Commerce Secretary there in North Carolina says there's been no economic impact, at least not measurable, on North Carolina's economy. Uh, does it matter, though, if we're seeing the political impact of what it did for conservatives there? Yeah, well, it wouldn't be the first time that, that uh, the media focused on an economic economic impact that was supposedly devastating that wasn't actually borne out by the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Look, I, th I think the most interesting thing about, about this sort of looking forward is whether this becomes a model for how Democrats operate nationwide. They're taking a position that I think is still a minority position. I mean, remember, the, 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 I mean, you know, to Charlie's point, what, what HB2 did was in effect say that people should go to the bathrooms uh, assigned, you know, uh, with the biology that they were born with, which I think for most Americans is not not that controversial, mm -hmm. is not that mean-spirited. I mean, that's what the polling shows. But what you saw was this massive uh, movement, really, by the left and by Democrats, uh, pushed initially in the, in the Charlotte City Council and then sort of forwarded or encouraged by uh, left-wing groups nationally to make this a huge issue and to suggest that anybody who would support that is somehow extreme. It's really flipping this on mm -hmm. its head. And you wonder whether Democrats won't choose to pick these fights, to move these things through city councils that require the response, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, you say McCrory was baited. You know, I think they would argue this required us to weigh in on this because of, of the move that the city council had made. But I think the exasperation with it is the fact that the, that the government has a, a solution here. The, the, the government is not involved here. You don't need the government to pass a law like this. Well, these parents and people who are upset about this, their argument is, I don't want my young daughter going into a restroom where there sure. could be a man in there. So in, in those cases, sure, they're going to want the I government to step in. I think in. where most people come from, uh, an issue like that would get settled very quickly. Uh, <laughs> you know. According to my Twitter feed, yeah, I've heard from a lot of you dads there. And yeah, a lot of you believe in the Second Amendment as well as all the other ones. Okay. Thank you, panel. Stick around. Up next, we're going to show you what happens when your anchor, not this one, the one who's usually here, when his fashion sense is as aggressive as his journalism. You don't want to miss this. Finally tonight, since you kindly let us into your home this Christmas, we thought we would return the favor. The Fox News DC team had some fun last night at our annual holiday party that Brett Baer throws for everyone here. Brett, check it out. Looking quite dapper in that suit. Stole the show. Check it out. Just like our motto, he is fair, balanced, and definitely, I would say, unafraid based on that outfit. Some friendly faces there. Check it out. Former special report anchor Britt Hume. As you'll remember, Brett took the reins of special report nearly eight years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. January 5th, 2009. Merry Christmas and happy holidays from our family to yours. We're going to get more details on that suit so all of you can purchase your own. Thank you for watching Special Report. I'm Shannon Bream. Good night from Washington. The one and only Tucker Carlson, and we'll see what he's wearing, is up next. Check it out.